Well, hello there. Welcome back to Agustino Zinger Show, episode number 306 with me, your host, Agustino Zinger. How's it going? How are you feeling? Good. Great to know. I'm feeling amazing. It's um, Tuesday, the, what, the 28th of uh, April, somewhere along that timeline. And um, yeah, finally, the skies have opened and started to rain in good old London. Not sure what's happening anywhere else where you are sitting right now, but it's a good thing. Because the last couple of days have been a little bit, um, how can I say, crazy due to the amount of people that have been outside, parading around, frolicking in parks, just, you know, really skirting the laws when it comes to staying indoors. And, you know, it got me really angry. Not really. I don't really give a shit, to be honest. Um, I think the whole people getting angry because maybe it's the hipster, it's the hipster part of me, you know, that hasn't died since the old days, but... There's a part of me that's like when everyone jumps on this bandwagon of trying to take the piss out of people that go outside and, you know, whining and complaining online. Stay in, stay in, stay at home, stay the fuck home, all that sort of shit. I get a bit over it. I'm like, you know what? You guys need to jog on, relax, take it easy. It's not that serious. Um, we're all human. We all understand the need for people to go outside. It's not as if they're trying to go out and attend a nightclub somewhere, you know, or fucking, you know, break into a cinema. They're just trying to go outside and get some fresh air, maybe see some people. Uh, or just or I even thought the other day maybe some people are just going outside just so they can get into an argument with some random person at Morrison's right some random fucking dude at Tesco's who bumps into you in the aisle or who stands too close to your fucking M&M you just want to have a little route and just get a little bit of you know um, personal uh, and physical energy shared between you and this stranger in the store some people might just want to do that so I think some people need to get off their high horse leave those people alone if they want to go outside if they want to you know, do what they want to do, let them do it, I think what's more important, but then it goes to show just, you know, in this social media age that we live in, people are more concerned about what other people are not doing, as opposed to what you should be doing, if you're staying indoors and you're avoiding all the necessary things, you're making good precautions, you're wearing a face mask when you do as go outside, you're making sure you don't touch your face, washing your hands, all that blah 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 stuff, why should you worry about what people are doing, why should it be any of your concern, I wouldn't give a fucking fuck, but I think it's those kind of, um, you know, uh, busybodies who, when they see a, someone fighting outside, they try and stop it. It's like you don't know what that person's carrying in their hand. You don't know what the beef, where they're beefing about. There might be, there might be a reason why. You know, some friends are allowed to just fight. You know, let's just swing, come to blow sometimes, just to get some steam off. And here you come, Mister Busybod, trying to break up things. Hey guys, and stop being, stop being so aggressive. And then you get sparked in the face, and all of a sudden you're laid at flat out cold in front of Liverpool Street Station with your fucking Gucci loafers on the other side of the road. It doesn't make any sense. Just, you know, keep mind your own business. It's the same way everyone's saying, stay home, hashtag stay the fuck home. Mind your fucking business. People are going outside, let them do it. It's their business. Who cares, right? Do you know what I mean? It's not going to impact you anyway, show up your form. And also your family members and people that you love are inside and they're obeying the rules. Everything should be fine. And anyway, if they want to go outside, let them. Who cares, man? Like, and as well as part of me, that's the, there's a, there is a part of me that's a little bit like, you know, who are these media outlets so that are sending their you know photojournalists out to take these incredibly high res long range pictures of people in parks hanging around doing you know park things like who does that right going and snitching on your fellow put you know, on your fellow countrymen and publishing these photos and papers who, who thinks that's a good occupation imagine that being your job disgusting isn't it like for, for all the wrong that they're doing don't get me wrong but like going around taking pictures of people with your fucking dslr well look at them they're in the park that is some bitch thing isn't it like come on Ugh. but i guess this whole epi- this whole pandemic has really brought out this kind of height and it's kind of allowed people who are a little bit you know whiny and complainy to have a you know you have a you have a reason to be that way now in it because in position that everyone's kind of been inconvenienced so when inconvenience comes along also the kind of whiny bitchy person raises ugly head the person that complains a lot has a perfect reason to complain and to kind of moan and to bitch and to whine and to snitch and this is the perfect avenue for them and look what they're doing they're out here fucking texting people texting newspapers informing journalists on twitter about what's going on so ugh, get some self-respect man and anyway like i don't know I, like I care so little about what other people are doing that it just fascinates me how people could care so much. I guess I'm on the other other, other side of the of the aisle. Do you know what I mean? I just don't understand how you could give that much of that much of a toss about people that have nothing to do with your life. But you know, what can you do? Um, 
what have I been doing? I've been just doing the normal stuff, training, running, reading loads, watching loads of movies. I piled through a couple of good ones and a couple of bad ones. I watched that movie called 2012, you know, that disaster movie that came out a while back. Fucking garbage, but, you know, there's something about the disaster movies that are kind of hitting the spot for me at the moment. I've also finished watching Band of Brothers, which is really good. Um, old school, wartime uh film mockumentary sort of thing it's intersliced with some um, accounts from actual veterans that fought um within when that fought in the second world war um which is really good and so obviously an all-star cast of people because it's a hbo production there's a sneaky cameo from jimmy fallon on there as well doing his acting work but yeah it's really good to see that um because it's got some good recommendations if you like war movies or any sort of all that kind of malarkey then you definitely should check out band of brothers if you haven't already and then i watched extraction on netflix that was really good with chris hensworth he did a superb job uh, for the directors and the cinematographers did a good job as well of uh portraying um is it i'm, I'm assuming it was india well no it's pakistan i'm not too sure but wherever that was um they did a good way of representing it the right way they got a lot of bollywood actors and actresses to work in the movie too um that represented that culture well as well i love the fact that they were speaking in their native tongue so you got a real um uh, feel of the place um and chris hensworth again man i think he smashed it i think he could play that role all, all day long man the kind of swashbuckling swashbuckling um you know drunken uh operative i'm not sure if tools spoiler alert if you haven't watched it, i'm not sure if he's still alive in the movie towards the end but he may be but i would like to see him do more of those movies going forward um maybe kind of like a redo of like jason bourne or like an evolution of that kind of template especially um the idea that you know he's got this troubled uh checkered past maybe suffers from ptsd maybe there's some anguish in his family life that he hasn't necessarily dealt with and then he uses the fact that he goes on these lonesome missions as a way to kind of like numb the pain and to also put himself into harm's way that could be a good option but what struck me about the chris hensworth um bit was that he's a lot taller and a lot bigger than most action heroes you see on screen Maybe, maybe the exception of, I don't know, Keanu Reeves, if you want to call him an action hero. Most of the people that we accept that we see on TV that play those roles are quite slight in stature and then they make them look bigger in the movie, right? But um, you, Chris Hesnoff is legitimately, I don't know, what, six foot or something, right? He must be. So him running on the bridge, you definitely saw that. That's the first thing I noticed straight away. I was like, oh, he's really tall. Like, he's a big dude. You know what I mean? So I, I'm not just sure if maybe the reason why he wasn't getting cast in these roles, which is really dumb to say, yeah, he's 190 in it, right? So he's like, what, six foot two. So I think the reason why he might have not been cast in these roles beforehand was the fact that he has a bigger build and maybe on TV, because they say TV at 10 pounds. So if you are, you know, six two on 180 pounds, you look fucking gargantuan. And you only have to look at what Dwayne Dwight Johnson looks like on television. I'm sure he looks he's big as well don't get me wrong but i don't think he's as big as he makes out on tv so maybe that's the reason why they didn't cast him because he, he does this role really well um a lot better he's, he does he looks a lot more authentic than others he you think he did some combat training for it um overall i thought he really did a really good job and i like the fact that he wasn't like the they they did a really good twist on like the white not they didn't do the white savior sort of motif they, they really let him kind of integrate with the cast in the place that it was filmed um there was a lot of different layers towards it you know the kind of idea that there's two warring drug lords um which you know i didn't really know you know india had a problem with drugs in that regard which they probably i don't know if they do to that extent but the fact that the highlights in the movie is kind of shining a light on kind of the seedy parts of maybe that um whole glitzy bollywood um, entertainment industry right um, where the work worlds are kind of converging and shit um, you saw this idea that you know these those kind of drug lords are usually kind of um, given there's no other option for them right those kids that are growing up in those shanty towns in India like um, the one kid that kind of has gone to grow up and maybe take over from one position he sort of has no option but to just fill that role because you know he's essentially seeing his friends getting chucked off the top of a building of course you haven't watched it you know watch it already that's a spoiler for somebody who's intending but um yeah it's a great movie i thought this guy that he fights as well in the movie did really well he's a great actor this one dude here on the right hand side he plays the um the Na the indian navy seal but all in all man a really really good movie um an easy watch for those of you who are you know um 
hell bent on watching Netflix movies only. I know some people don't watch anything unless it's on Netflix. So if you're that way inclined and you want something to watch during the week or the weekend, definitely check it out, man. It's a really, really good movie. Um, everyone did a really good job in it, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, he's a handsome motherfucker, isn't he? Jesus Christ. But anyway, <laughs> let's get him off the screen. What else to move? What else do we want to speak about here before we move on? Da, 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 da. Okay, so let's get into some good bits. So I just w- finished watching the Last Dance Jordan documentary, or well, you know, Jordan do- documentary about the Chicago Bulls. But you know, focuses a lot on Michael Jordan. And then um, episode three and four on Netflix. And if you haven't watched it already, I really recommend you do watch it, especially if you're a sports fan. Again, I'm no NBA fanatic. I'm no NBA geek. I don't know much about the sport itself, but bloody hell, what an illuminating look at you know somebody that kind of has surpassed you know sporting uh you know achievements and kind of pierced through into you know the general consensus the consciousness you know everyone recognizes michael jordan's name or his face or his likeness even if you're not a fan of nba so being able to be that powerful to have that much of an impact you have to give it a watch it just for just for the curiosity alone um, similar to like an Elvis Presley documentary, right? You might not understand what he meant because you weren't around during the time that he was popping, but just to find, just to have some kind of context, just put some context towards it, it's quite, um, um, it's recommended viewing, you know, so check that out too. So I recommend you the same thing for this documentary. So three and four focused a lot on um, Dennis Rodman and the rivalry the Bulls had with the Detroit Pistons. And I thought the Dennis Rodman um, episodes were maybe some of the best bits of TV. And another reason another kind of not reason but another sort of um illustration of just how important it is to embrace the weirdos and the freaks of our society and give them a kind of give them a runway to express themselves as opposed to kind of putting a you know um a a chain around their neck and pulling them back i think you need to be able to give them the room to just do what they do and then kind of guide them along the way but kind of pulling them back kind of shackling them down and trying to change who they are you're not going to bring the best out of them and i didn't know much about dennis rodman's off well i knew some bits about dennis rodman's off-field activities but i didn't know he went that hard in the paint when he went to going out like there's one story they talk about where he's you know i think at the time scotty pippen was either on strike because he was injured or he was injured but he refused to play anywhere regardless until you know um the, the balls kind of um, traded him that wasn't going to happen for a while so then uh, he decided to come back and just start playing again and um, i think at the time pippen rodman and jordan were the kind of free horsemen so when pippen was out rodman kind of stepped in and so like took that kind of a uh, semi-leadership position and so was able to be the person that Jordan could rely on and then pippen came back again um P- rodman felt like the third wheel and went to like let's let his hair down and also he also wasn't really up for maintaining that good boy attitude i think jordan mentioned a few times that um robin was basically killing himself trying to keep on a straight and narrow the whole time which he did right which i think says a lot about him that he's he was able to kind of put his own knees and wants to one side for the better of the team he was like, okay cool this is not what i want to do i could be having much more fun you know in a, in, a, in a club somewhere surrounded by hookers and blow and drinks and shit but i'm gonna stay here i'm gonna do the good do, do the best job as i can until my other teammate comes back and i can let my hair down and he proceeds to do that he decides he asks the management to take 40 hours he, he wants a holiday first right he went to vacation he doesn't get the vacation that he wants so they tell him can you accept 48 hours and he takes that and i think it ends up being three days or something but it was just the willingness for the team phil jackson michael jordan as being you know one of the leaders of the team or the leader of the team to be able to like give to understand who he was as a character and also give him the opportunity but also i think it says a lot about the instrument because you don't usually get given those opportunities unless your teammates your colleagues know that when it's game time you show up if they're not if they're worried about that they're never going to give you the opportunity so i think it says a lot about his character too that he was somehow able to do both and i think most weirdos most freaks most outliers can do both but i think within the corporate world within rigid within rigid yeah with rigid corporations within kind of uh, rigid startups within um, very conservative maybe sports franchises or whatever institution they may be i think sometimes they get worried that the kind of you know 
the 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 sort of eccentric characters will sometimes influence the people that will behave to stray of course and they also don't want to encourage that kind of behavior point blank on it but I, what i do like about america as well especially american sports maybe all sports are like this but because that's why i like sports in general is that if you're talented and you deliver on the field they usually give you more leeway when it comes to things that don't concern game day right so if you're a shit training usually and you don't turn up on time some, uh, not turn up on time but let's just say you don't play well in training because turn up on time i think is a kind of fundamental baseline you have to meet but let's say you just don't perform well in training but when it comes to the match that you always perform most teams would be perfectly okay with letting you you know do what you want to do on the weekends do what you want to do after the match is finished do what you want to do sometimes even straight after the match is finished right they don't give a fucking fuck as long as they know that you're going to perform on a game day but i think sometimes in corporations they don't do that they want everyone to be so well behaved in every single asset that when it comes to you know let's imagine you go you have some sort of time to go let your hair down and you get a little bit loose they get really worried that your behavior is going to influence others and then they kind of curtail that and then you end up being bitter you end up being a little bit resentful of what has happened you end up not being a good employee that ends up kind of reverberating over everybody else and then suddenly you've got a bad working culture but if corporations are able to incorporate a little bit of that and kind of sprinkle in some fanatical characters in their group it would let everybody know where the levels are at because if you realize in the documentary when he comes back from his like three day binge or, or five day um bender sorry um phil jackson purposely tries to put him through a really hard workout thinking that he wouldn't step up and he wouldn't be able to hack it and he smashes it of course isn't it right and then he realizes okay cool we're dealing with a freak of an animal we need to be able to kind of give this guy leeway to kind of do his thing on the outside because when it comes to training even not even game day and just coming to practice and getting back into match fitness he was right back where he started from like he didn't miss a beat so i think that was really impressive even just seeing him coming down to the basketball court wearing his pajamas and his slippers and shit was super funny but i thought that was really cool i liked the relationship between each other i thought that was really sweet um and you know you got a feeling you you definitely understood watching it why some some athletes miss sports professional sports and that kind of locker room com camaraderie so much camaraderie or whatever that word is called because you don't get that same sort of understanding on the outside world no way no one gives a shit about you the same way your teammates do no one understands you the same way your teammates do you don't bust your shovels balls the same way your teammates do so you step out into the real world stuff becomes a bit weird and, it, and really corporate and really well to do and well behaved and proper and shit but in this sort of arena when you're fighting for a common goal i think that or for a common goal especially the nba championships it sort of works itself out that way but i thought his um introduction to the series was really cool obviously the you know uh, introduction of common Electra kind of spiked some of the ratings got some interesting stories from her about her, their time together and just generally his kind of eccentric self was just really amplified and you got to see why he's such an icon such a legend um somebody was able to kind of you know be an integral part of the team um, whilst also maintaining his own personality and not kind of bending to you know the expectation of what a professional athlete should look like or act like so yeah definitely appreciate that one and then let's move on the next one i thought was interesting part of it was how good of a sport michael jordan was right you don't necessarily hear this about him you hear you hear rumors or rumblings from nba fans who say that michael jordan was a bit of a dick and of course most of it comes from you know if you're an nba fan during that era and he was spanking your team around you're not gonna have good words to say about him right but i never knew he was that much of a you know f uh but you're a stickler for like you know uh the right kind of conduct on the on the court when it came to you know if he lost or if he won he definitely shook hands just being professional so you would go to the end with him on the court right you'd elbow each other you'd make each other bleed you'd break each other's noses and shit someone might roll their ankle but when it came to the end and the game was over you'd all shake each other's hand maybe you get you you know you grab a closer wine with somebody share a cigar whatever it may be but there would be the understanding that you know this is what professionals do they go to war on the court but then when it's off the court it's done it's over it's squashed so it was really interesting to see how 
annoyed Jordan got by the whole thing with the Detroit Pistons and you have to understand especially looking at it for just the video clips you know they always said that that, that era the 80s and the 90s was a completely different game especially even the early 2000s the physicality of basketball was just insane seeing these big burly dudes right running into each other and sometimes you know nowadays especially with how they call fouls and the clips I've seen if you just leave a bit of your arm out and someone runs into it and flops, you know, you're going to get penalised. But back in the day, they would be strung up in each other, their arms and their, you know, their shoulders, their biceps, their elbows, their palms and their hands would be, you know, smashing into someone's face. It was really aggressive and um, it was cool to see that, even though from what it looked like, you know, they, they treat you Jordan like you know Antonio Reyes when he first played for Arsenal against United and Gary Neville and Co just kicked lumps out of him that's what it reminded me of when I saw Jordan against Detroit Pistons they were very aware that you know we're not going to match him up in skill but as soon as this guy drives towards the, the basket we're going to do everything we can to stop him jumping and bloody hell it definitely worked but after getting pummeled a few times beating in a conference uh, what, beating in a conference yeah beating in a conference being in a championship he always made sure to shake their hands so i guess when it came to the point where the chicago bulls finally got one over the detroit pistons you can understand why he was held so much of a grudge about the whole thing but looking at it you're like fucking hell mate this was how many years ago and you're still pissed off about it now when they tried to explain to him what isaiah Thomas had to say about the whole situation he just didn't want to hear it um but again it just comes down to his kind of base level of respect is just that you know once the game is over you have to shake my hand no matter what win lose or draw just shake each other's hands it's over it's done with and i think that does speak volumes about the dude man say what you like about him but he's a pretty good pro in that respect so i was really surprised to see that that was such a big issue for him um going forward but some of the aggression look even where the hands are look at his face he's just getting pummeled on the right it's just insane to see how much he had to go through um, in order to become you know the legend that he is now he really went for the ring which maybe explains why a lot of basketball fans are so hesitant to say LeBron James is better because Jordan had to really go and come through with fire like if you see this picture on the right look look at look at that look at all the amount of players are all over him. you've got one underneath one on top you've got a hand here you've got someone here ready to get the rebounds or anything that drops down absolutely insane and then the last point I wanted to make on this was that, um, of course, I think Detroit Pistons were the stoke of NBA. Um, and I, I can I definitely understand why every team hated playing against them because, you know, they didn't necessarily play attractive brand of basketball. Um, anytime one of your players has to wear these plastic sort of like... Um, what do you call them these sort of like face mask protective things is usually a bad sign it usually means you got some bruises in your team that means he must have broke his nose a couple of times and it's repairing or his cheekbone must have cracked something happened his cheekbone fracture that's not a good sign some of your teammates are wearing these sort of things in their faces it means you guys have got a whole team full of bruises so i can definitely understand why basketball teams hated them and it's weird though isn't it because usually basketball you get the idea that you know there's all this dribbling and fucking flying through the air and shit but there seems to be an acceptance in basketball more so than maybe football that you can win this ugly and it'd be okay like they all praise quite highly they were gloating about winning a championship you know rightfully so and people remember them as a great team but when you do that in football in soccer for the most part you know the opposite opposing team gives you those a stick the players seem quite embarrassed by it all like you don't see a lot of the Greek players that won the Euros parading around, you know, gallivants and their trophies around there. It's you're sort of feeling embarrassed by it. You obviously got it in history books, but it's not something that you gloat about, right? It's no like, you know, it's no fucking United v fucking, you know, Bayern Munich in the Champions League final. Um which is interesting that that kind of gets promoted but again I, I, I thought that approach was really good as well I think there's understanding more so than basketball than maybe football that what the players that you have available you mould your team your style of play around the players you have as opposed to players you don't have if you've got a bunch of bruises on your team that are formerly known as the bad boys you just kind of embrace it and make sure that you can play that way maybe you have a couple people in the team that can score but for the most part everyone's kind of you know arms elbows and knees look at that guys are throwing punches during the game and it's a white guy as well not even the crazy black dude you know what i mean that's insane to see but i thought that was cool and then lastly 
Isaiah Thomas's horrendous excuse as to why. Because I think this clip is on. No, I'm not going to show a clip because I'll probably get demonetized. But this image here shows, I think, um, the other Isaiah Thomas getting a lot of stick online because of what's happening. But I thought his excuse, I don't it's interesting, isn't it? He didn't want to really, he didn't acknowledge why he got that stick he got right which reminds me a lot of like you know um, i'd imagine if luis suarez got an interview now and they asked him about the stick he received after the whole petri severa negro thing he would also not have any understanding why i don't know why it is with athletes they have this blind spot when it comes to their own actions and the consequences of it they don't see it, or they seem to have a different recollection i remember someone saying it about editing film editing that like once you start editing videos on youtube and shit or just editing any sort of you know video footage you your memory tends to get a bit fucked up because you start to remember shit the way you edit like you remember it in bits and you put it together but it's not necessarily had the chronological had that's not necessarily a chronological reflection of what actually happened and maybe it's if it happened to athletes because you're just so in it and you're in a seat i don't know but there's just a reason i don't know what the reason is there's a reason why some most athletes regardless of where what kind of sport they're in they always seem to have a blind spot when it comes to their own action they don't seem to recognize or to understand why other people can interpret their actions differently or they don't seem to have any sort of like doesn't have any valid validity to them at all they're just like no i don't get it it's not true it didn't happen is that okay fair enough but I thought that was very telling and the fact that you know Michael Jordan still hates his guts to this day was really good um I'm one f I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of holding grudges I have to be honest um and that's not a popular thing to say but I think holding grudges is normal and I think more people do it than not but they just don't admit they do I think part of the reason why a lot of people are successful and do the things they do now primarily because of a grudge or because of some sort of resentment they have towards somebody they want to prove wrong I know for most of my career has been that, has been trying to prove people wrong, have been trying to stick stick it up someone's face that said no, or that let me go, or whatever it may be. I would just be like, no, all right, cool, I'm going to prove you wrong. And usually it always happens. And I'm usually very aware of like kind of reminding that person, hey, by the way, do you remember how you said something X, Y, Z? Look at me now. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing, especially if you don't let it, you know, take over you and consume you, as long as you just use this motivation and fuel, what's wrong with that? Um, and I think Jordan, it worked well for Jordan as well going forward, didn't it really? Because imagine you're the game before the championship final and you do that against your Pistons and you get one of your, you know, long or, you know, someone that you kind of really hated for a while and you end up kind of, you know, crushing that team and pissing off on their star men so much so that they kind of cower out of the stadium without shaking anyone's hand. And again, it's weird that even to this day, he, still he thinks it was some kind of like, you know, bold look of like, fair enough, you beat us, we're ducking. They still look, even in the video, when you watch it, like they're kind of ducking under people's arms and being a bit coy about it. I think if you're going to not shake someone's hand and be a dick, you've got to do it with your chest up, isn't it? You can't just be like cowering under people's arms and just trying to hide and being all shy about it. Like, you know, have your chest up, like, you know, what? What? But, yeah. That documentary is flipping incredible. I really reckon you check it out, man. Last Dance on Netflix now is bloody great. Let's move on. So, what's next on here? Um, let's move up some stuff, actually. So, yeah, let's, 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 let's do this one. I'll move up this. So, this is a really interesting uh, video from, um, all, I think it's All Breaks No Gas, right? Because there's, there's an interesting debate happening in the States now with the coronavirus you know there's a group of people out there's a group of people who just don't believe it's real right that's one thing and then there's a group of people out there who believe you know the government were a bit extreme um states should be allowed to independently decide when they reopen um the lockdown was too heavy-handed um there's no finishing line in sight businesses are gonna go you know businesses are gonna go out of business people are losing livelihood once the economy reopens there's not gonna be any jobs to go back to that kind of frame of mind and i'm and i'm and i'm and i really understand it has a lot of sympathy towards it and i kind of i get it man if a lot of, if if the majority of people especially in the states where they don't enjoy the kind of protections or the kind of uh, rights or the kind of uh, benefits that we do here in europe right they don't have 28 day holidays or whatever that amount 21 days that we have here they don't have paid sick leave um 
the minimum wage isn't that high depending on what state you live in so i definitely understand why some people in the states are really against like having the uh, economy locked down for you know unspecified point in time especially for a virus that seems to be only affecting a certain um percentage of the population you know you can't say it's affecting everybody the same because it's not uh, but it is affecting people of a certain age of a certain medical disposition or certain medical conditions more you know negatively than other people so it's definitely definitely within their right to say you know hey what's going on to ask some questions but the weird thing is that the people that we see on media protesting especially the ones that we see in the video i want to play in a minute they're always a whack job it's always the people that are just like on the fringes the ones that are just like you know f- figuratively and li- figuratively have like a tin for a hat in their back pocket which isn't a bad thing right you're allowed to con let's be conspiracy theorists and question what you want to question but it's the ones that operate right on the fringes of things who believe every and uh, every and every conspiracy theory that exists um they just subscribe malevolence to everything nothing can just be like you know the fact that nothing can just be like an, uh, an administrative oversight or just you know incompetence it always has to be malevolent it always has to be some sort of sinister ploy to like you know overtake people and take away their rights all this sort of stuff and i don't really understand why they can't why even that crowd of people there isn't one person able to make a salient point a salient clear point as to why they think it's a bad idea to have the country locked down for so long just be able to say in like a clear way like hey i understand some people are dying but i'm working in a gig economy i'm working in the service industry i don't have any protections my company isn't getting any protections from the government which is affecting me because my job is gone i've been fired i've got a, i've got three kids just say something clearly like that and then protest people will be fairly fine with it but it seems like everybody they see in this video is just a complete nutter and um, i'm gonna play it now for you guys to hear a little bit of it but it's a video by this guy called all gas no breaks and it's filmed um in I washington dc i think during the rallies that happened i think just the other day or maybe a couple of weeks ago i'm gonna play a bit of it now for you guys to hear there boom 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 this guy's already complaining he's got every right so let's go back to the start yeah, it's called uh, it's from coronavirus lockdown protests from all gas no breaks i got every problem when the government say we can't go out that's a prohibition and it's illegal it's against the constitution i am immune compromised i put that at risk today i put that at risk today because i gotta be here that's a bold move in being immune compromised and deciding to head out um amongst all these people who are obviously not observing any sort of social distancing the you know personal protective gear is few and far between but jesus christ us are you scared to die but the good thing is that a lot of them don't have there's not a lot of trump waving flags and stuff i think sometimes whenever those flags come up people have i don't know why they have a tendency to just completely tune it out but people have to support they want to support in it i don't think that's a bad thing but as soon as those flags go up especially seeing in those kind of places they always clip that image and put it up like, oh crazy trump fans are going to be drinking bleach and protesting outside dc like i don't know man no more scared than i am for anything else freedom 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 that, like high on newsom that's gavin newsom i'm assuming one of the gov the governor of new of california i'm assuming right as I say, please don't feed the fears, and and that's a legitimate thing. That one of them is like obviously batshit crazy, but that one on the right is a legitimate placard to hold up in it, right? Please don't feed the fears, because most of the news you see online, or most you know most news sources, even TV, they're kind of stirring this pot because it's for them it's generated a lot of clicks, right? And if they say that every time the news, every time kind of mainstream media is about to you know capitulate or uh, big publication about to go out of business Trump says something stupid they get during those clicks every, it pays everyone's salary for like six months and then suddenly now this com- this coronavirus couldn't come at a better time for some of these people isn't it right because what else do they have to talk about with the you know impeachment inquiry gone away there's nothing really to get their teeth sunk into especially with all this stuff about you know Joe Biden's rape accuser coming out there was stuff that they didn't want to talk about that'll be out in a news cycle so this is perfect for them so there is a legitimate argument to be had about you know are the news media being responsible are they uh, stoking the fears but instead you have this absolute donut with a high old newsome banner it's like what you kind of you might not agree with the guy's politics but are you legitimately trying to say this guy's hitler open up you 
It's like a nightmare, isn't it? It's like what you imagine. How many? Well, you tell me. Three or, three or how four. Many do, how many does Disney own? <laughs> how many? How many? I don't know. Well, maybe you ought to find out. You're in the media, aren't you? Yeah, but I'm independent. You're independent what? Independent media. Me and this guy. It's called All Gas, No Brakes. I don't see your badge. You're independent. We're independent. You're independent of what? Independent media. Oh, God almighty, man. Exactly. What's that say? What's that say? Vaccines are not the cure. What's that say? Vaccines are not placebo safety tested. What does that even mean? Vaccines are not placebo safety tested. Okay, and this sign here. It says, hell hath no fury like a pissed off patriot. Good American, a born free American. They're lying about the death tolls. I will take a chance to get a coronavirus whether than, better than shutting down this economy. Okay, okay, there you go. That's, that's, that's a fair enough point. It's fucking nuts anyway to say, but fair enough point, isn't it? He's willing to get it. As long as they're able to recover in the economy, right? Some people are able to. Some people trust the economy more so than they trust the. Some people have more faith in the economy than they do the what medical industry or humanity or their lives or what camps up. Because sometimes I wonder with these kind of older people, don't they have grandkids? Like, if you're that comfortable with willing to accept the risk for yourself, aren't you also willing to accept risk for your unborn grandkids or your children at least? Because I think the other way around doesn't work. I think if you ask people that are younger about to care about older people, they're not going to happen. Either. They don't give a fucking fuck. I know when I was, you know, 15, if you told me to care about somebody else 21, I'd be like, what? They're going to die tomorrow. I mean, I wouldn't have no caring. So to make to do it the other way maybe makes more sense. But on my knees. Yeah, I want you to take the vaccine first, Bill Gates. Okay. I want you to understand, this is China's wet dream to hurt our nation. It's their wet dream. And this is about our liberty, brother. Who do you think's agenda this is? <coughs> Freedom! 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 Prolonged lockdown, basically, is slavery. Do you, uh, do you feel enslaved? Uh, I do. I that is nuts, isn't it? That's maybe the... And again, maybe it's, you know, the intention of the YouTuber to purposely, you know, highlight the batshit crazies, but they look like a fairly well adjusted family i think they are right there's the same kind of ink used on the paper and they look at like the standing together the family the dad the mom and the kid i don't know and this woman's legitimately saying that prolonged lockdown is like slavery mama mia just beggars belief really isn't it like again there is a there is a point to be had to, to argue against you know to question why some bits of information we'll withhold why some you know why maybe the white house didn't react quick enough why didn't trump close all it's a, another central travel from other countries coming in blah 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 blah. you know i don't know there's questions to be had about about it you can question some things but to, to ascribe slavery to lockdown is just i'm a type a lawyer and i'm bouncing off the walls of my living room because i can't go out california not communism everybody yeah, cough communism. in my face yes. do it somebody come cough in my face <laughs> yes <laughs> cough directly <laughs> in my face <laughs> well, yeah, wait. <laughs> no wait i never did put on hand sanitizer ever and i don't ever wash my hands can you believe that believe it because it's true in my opinion we're looking at a I'm seasonal but the non-washing non -washing of hands thing, I've seen a few people mention, I saw some news anchor, Fox do it the other day actually, um, I forgot who it was, that seems to be a thing you hear a lot of people saying, and there was definitely, when you know the first lockdown started, it was maybe a bit too much emphasis put around you know people washing their hands and shit, it made me wonder, like, it's always like, you know, whenever you see a sign somewhere, you know, in a public space, telling you not to do something, it's usually um, a good indication that somebody else did that before, Right when it says, "Oh, please do not urinate on the walls," it means some idiot decided to piss all over the walls. So there's a part of me that thinks, "Well, there are a lot of people out there who just don't wash their hands at any point in time." Now, don't get me wrong. You know, when you're out and you're head drunk and you're going to grab a burger after a club night, I don't expect you to be washing your hands in the toilet somewhere. But 
generally day to day do people just not wash their hands it's just you know when they shower that's just that just counts as a washing of hands maybe it's a thing because a lot of them are emphasizing that it's really strange thing to kind of gloat about in it like just just because you happen to live in in the western world and you have access to like you know western medicine and you know great health care that you'll be able to get away with this but the moment you get put in a place where you don't have those um you know afforded those luxuries suddenly these kind of these little character flaws or these sort of like um things that you do these habits suddenly get you know punished but and again he just he just might be a whack job in it and a lot of these people might be whack jobs because you sometimes think to yourself like who's legitimately gonna take time out of their day to go to dc and protest like really like who's sane who kind of you know has all their marbles not many um i probably ascribe that to you know people that maybe leave negative comments on online like who what 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 section of the of the public does that re- actually represent not a lot it's usually just the, the vocal few who are always online and always connected would probably go to this too because you would have to find out about this for the internet right i'd imagine it'll be some sort of group or some sort of event shared around the place and then you kind of go and turn up and there's a lot of steps that have to take you from being at home to this place so again it might be representative of everybody but it's just unfortunate that the kind of rational same people who have a legitimate questions as to why they're locked down still in maybe states that haven't got as haven't been affected as much are being represented by someone like this right who's like got t-shirt proud to be corona free like he achieved something of worth blue in a bunch of fake death numbers go ahead america touch your face go out and have sex and don't worry about touching anything fucking touch anything and everything it makes your immune system stronger i used to be afraid of raw eggs and raw meat and now i drink raw eggs and i eat raw meat and i have been for years and i'm fucking fine every conspiracy you've pretty much ever heard of is all pretty much true 9-11 was an inside job no one's ever walked on the moon the vaccines are poison can you cough in my face Good girl from walking away. See, people are too, they're too scared to even cough <laughs> off when you ask, <laughs> ask them to. We don't have a civil right to be immortal. If only the healthy people are okay and the people who are at risk get ill, isn't that how it's supposed to be? I, I mean, just look at this dude. We don't have a civil responsibility to be healthy or to be alive. And just look at him morbidly beast riding a bike with more gadgets and accrues from sonnet than the fucking action man oh google gadget he's got a bluetooth headset that's from like i don't know what century that's from a power pack on his phone his phone is plugged into a mount on his bike he's got you know high vis outfit on what's that an accreditation thing on his neck some sort of what like uh public surveying shit just an absolute horror show in it we are teaching fear, not courage. I call it the original name, the 2019 NCOV, because it's not yeah, the SARS. That makes a difference. That's huh? the disease. What we have here, statistically, is <laughs> You've run out of steam in it. Look. Political science. We have to be able to protect our posterity. Pros, pros, posterity. Be. Invade. Encourage. So I, Incentivize yourself to be on jury duties. We just need to open the. Some people just shouldn't be allowed to procreate in it. That's just the point of it. I think to kind of end that one. Some people just shouldn't be allowed to have kids. You shouldn't be allowed to have kids if you're that dumb. Um, and again, it's not dumb because what they're saying, I don't agree with it, or because you know they don't have a point in what they're talking about. But it's just the the inability to articulate their thoughts in like a clear. Uh, logical sense making way is just bizarre especially when the argument is right there to be had right questioning why some states are still locked down when they're more to, when their fatality rate isn't as high as others questioning how long can they be under lockdown with everything that's going on in the economy questioning will their jobs be around when the economy reopens these legitimate questions that you can't have but instead this guy's trying to stipulate so what the actual name of it is worrying man like imagine that being your dad or something that bloody hell you just don't have any just sometimes just yeah 
bloody hell. God bless. But anyway, moving on. I thought this article here was really interesting from the New York Times. Um, a really cool um, op-ed written by a lady called Gabriella Hamilton, who is the co-founder, operator, owner of this restaurant called Prune. And it's really illuminating because it's essentially detailing her. It's titled, my restaurant was my life for 20 years. Does the world need it anymore? The subtext is, uh, forced to shutter, prune. I've been revisiting my original uh, dreams for it and wondering if there will still be a place for it in New York in the future. And I think that's a legitimate, um, it's like a really good world piece because at first I thought it was going to be like a woe is me sort of thing because there's a lot of people in the restaurant industry who have kind of, because I've been following it from the outside in, you know, reading the few Eater articles here and there, some Grubhub stuff, some films of people on social, and there's a lot of people really moaning, crying and bitching about this whole lockdown thing. And there's a lot of kind of entitlement, I feel, when it comes to some of the restaurateurs, which may be justified, might not be justified, I don't know. But from my point of view, I think most businesses, most areas of business have had to pivot and have had to innovate due to technology ramping up and sort of kind of um, pushing them into uh, accepting the inevitable future that's to come. But a lot of restaurateurs, a lot of bar owners have been resistant against it and sort of like holding on to the good old days in the hope that somehow life is going to go back to how it was for them when it was comfortable. And it's not, it's not how the world works, isn't it? But stuff changes, things have to innovate, people have different demands, um, their customer base changes especially, you know, they get aged out. Um, or they just move on to different things. So you have to kind of appeal to different people, especially if your place is, you know, um, if you're just going to operate your restaurant in the same location, you have to be able to attract different people. They're not going to be the same people going to be operating there or a day in, day out. I'd say more so for a you know, bar. Bars have a tendency to lose their cachet, lose their corners factor, um, especially if you're, you rely on being called. They tend to lose that. So you have to keep reinventing yourself every four or so years. Restaurants may be a bit longer, but there has to be an acceptance of like, you know, the world is changing around you. So I think a lot of them would be really resistant or putting, you know, menus online, sometimes doing any basic social media, sometimes not willing to, you know, the, the whole, we're well, not willing to accept deliveries, okay, because I think it does require an internal, it does require more work than what it seems like on the surface. There is a whole kind of infrastructure that has to be built in and around it. You have to maybe construct a different menu, which should be within your purview if you're, you know, an actual operator of a restaurant, you should be able to do that with your eyes closed. But I understand the resistance against that because, you know, it's a whole thing. But the idea that you can just get away with just being like this hole in a wall that people just discover is really ridiculous considering the most of the reason why people, just, especially from my thinking or from my experience, the most of the way that I discover new places is via YouTube videos, podcasts, you know, stuff I sign online on the internet or stuff I might see on social media. Um, tagged in places and you go into their page and you discover they got really cool photography or they got some cool characters in the restaurant that they're kind of propping up as kind of faces and influence or kind of brand ambassadors for this restaurant these kind of things you're just going to have to do and I think a lot of restaurateurs are really stuck in their ways which is disappointing to see because you know of course a lot of time, even if you do innovate it's no guarantee that you're going to survive when everything turns back to normal but we're going to lose a lot of the good places that we know and love just because you know their owners are so stubborn and so deep you know stuck in their ways and they weren't willing to accept anything different but i thought this lady made a really good point as to why she doesn't want to do it herself right um except the kind of future that's to come um it's down here let me see if i can find it it's a quote here about um the whole unwillingness to open or to do the whole delivery thing and i think it speaks to the reason why a lot of commentators like myself shouldn't speak to operators about what they all inf or have any kind of opinion or advice i don't think that's a good thing to do so where is if i can find it da, 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 da. for a long time i can't see myself excited doing it where is it oh, here it is Mm-hmm. Let's back up here for a minute. Let me see if I can find it. Get back to the screen. One second, bear with me. Uh I don't know who to follow it and find it here. I don't Yeah, there you go, it's found it. So this quote here says the following. I don't know whom to follow or what to think. Um everyone everyone says you should do to go you should sell gift cards you should offer delivery you need a social media presence you should pivot to groceries you should raise your prices a branzino is 56 dollars at via carto 
um, I have thought for many long minutes, days, weeks of confinement and quarantine, should I? Is that what Prune should do? What Prune should become? I cannot see myself excitedly daydreaming about the third party delivery ticket screens I will read orders from all evening. I cannot see myself sketching doodles or the to-go boxes while I pack my food into them so I can send them out into the, into the night, anonymously hoping the poor delivery guy does a great job and stays safe. I don't think I can sit around daydreaming up menus and cocktails and fantasizing about what they would be on my playlist just to create something that people will order, receive and consume via an app. I started my restaurant as a place for people to talk to one another and with a very decent but affordable glass of wine and an exper expertly prepared plate of simple braised lamb shoulder on the table to keep the conversation flowing and it ran as, sl as long as it should and it, and it ran as long and it ran it and ran it as I ran it as such as long as I could if this kind of place is not relevant in society then it we then it we should become extinct which I thought was a very um honest and refreshing take on it like you know the idea that maybe this is a form of natural selection which you know of course it's a bit glib to say but there must be some acceptance of some businesses that you know you can't just rely on things remaining the same for your business to exist that is a bit weird and also a little bit foolhardy for a little bit short-sighted and you're also opening yourself up to you know the competition coming alongside just sweeping you either way which might be a good thing and i think you know most businesses people say they're babies so it's hard to kind of you know quote unquote put your baby down and move on to something else but the idea that because i like i think she's obviously an experienced restaurateur so she's well aware of the idea that there's a lot that's going to go into it pivoted the brand to something else and maybe that's not a restaurant she wants to open some people you know, i never knew restaurant even existed so she might like that the idea that you just discover it by word of mouth people kind of recommend it to you you might be passing by and you might find it or you might have heard people talking about it someplace that you go or you might kind of hear it mentioned in a video somewhere but the fact that she is doing it the way that she's doing it so successfully over these 20 years is proof that it works and people like the way it's done but if it means that now post covid she has to pivot into something else it's not the same thing anymore and i think that's perfectly fine because the last thing you want is for the businesses to still have you around holding on for dear life and then for the owners to be bitter to be resentful and to not be enjoying what they're doing because that's definitely going to be reflected in the service definitely going to be reflected in the atmosphere in the food you get served on your plate everything's going to be really affected by that kind of um lack of uh, willingness and warmth or the or just the the lack of love that they have in any given moment i think sometimes the honorable thing to do in those occasions maybe to just hang up the, the shirts um i think in this piece she mentioned she's just going to see how long she can last with the money that they have available in the covers and if they can last until things reopen then so be if not it is what it is but that was a very refreshing um take on everything that's been happening and again she wasn't being well as me i think she mentions in the article here that she didn't want to accept any um donations from a gofundme or those kind of things which was again super admirable considering the amount of people out there grifting and begging and pleading with customers to kind of get the money to survive but again it would be cool to see government stepping in and offering some relief to these places that are you know it's it's kind of unfair that they don't get any kind of protection from their you know uh from their local government especially especially when they're contributing so much to their overall gdp um i'm sure with that restaurant out of that street they're going to say decrease the amount of money that they make you know even due, even via like parking fines and shit so it's always i always find that bizarrely short-sighted bizarrely short-sighted from some cities or some states where they don't necessarily embrace new they don't give any of these businesses that are actually bringing foot traffic into said location any kind of benefit any kind of government funding or support or whatever it may be um they somehow have this weird assumption or belief that if they just get rid of them and put someone else in their place it'll be okay and it's not necessarily the case sometimes people come to a particular street just because of the street but sometimes they come to that street because of the people that are there who are tied to our neighborhood who have ties to the community um who are just ingrained in anything that's good about it and then when you kind of rip it to pieces it just doesn't make any sense it's like it kind of reminds me of the whole jerry Krause thing in the jordan documentary 
he does everything he can to piss off Jordan and piss off Phil Jackson by telling him it's said last season before the season kicks off and it's like why would you ruin a good thing why not just let it run its course as it may be and then replace why do you have to kind of come out and be yeah so I don't know but definitely check it out um, it's called My Restaurant Was My Life for 20 years does the world need it anymore written by this lady called Gabrielle Hamilton again I'll link in the show if you guys to check out yourself but it's a really cool New York Times magazine piece that I thought was very interesting and then next on the list here, what do we have? Da, 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 da. Let's just go and visit the visor and see what's happening in the scene. See if there's anybody got events on still. Mm. I've been I've been off the streams by the way. I'm not really a fan of the streams anymore. I've kind of been uh, I'm a little bit over it. I'm done. Um, I'm gonna maintain and say I think DJing should be reserved to clubs. And club nights and bars and stuff it shouldn't be done online via live stream for you to enjoy remotely somewhere for you to pretend like everything's okay um or for you to pretend like that's fun because it clearly isn't i think part now we're definitely seeing the reason why people like stuff like boiler room is because you know it's a way for you to kind of be a voyeur and see other people having fun in the club somewhere where you're also at home but the idea of just being at home staring at someone play somewhere online is just not the lick for me um it's not fun doesn't have any kind of appeal uh the people that are doing it are a little bit trash as well and the setups in general are just like really uninspiring in it they're kind of a bit sad in it for the most part seeing the kind of setups that people are using when they're playing online it's just like bloody hell man it doesn't seem like the right place to be able. i've got a good but if you're gonna do it you can do it in a really fun way and show people that you um don't take yourself too seriously and i think this is a good example of it from uh this tech house dj called michael bevy who was on live stream and unfortunately he uh took a bit of a long break and people seem to notice his break that he was taking and someone put a clip of it online uh let's see if i can get it up on here bring it to the end to the start here put it up but this is him doing a live stream this is the this is the danger of doing live streams and all the time actually you get occasions like this you get things like this happening so that or I mean I think um, I'm a big fan of seeing my DJs have fun um, I'm not a fan of the kind of Ben UFO you know geek that knows everything about every record but doesn't look like he's you know ever had a bump in his life I'd like someone having a bit of fun letting their head down but that's hilarious and again it just goes to show the problems when it comes to live streaming at home you get too comfortable you think no one's looking again i don't know why he decided to put the plate underneath the decks when he could just have it to the side of the screen and walked off the school to our frame and i've not got got a bottle of water and pretending like he was doing that i don't know there's plenty of things he could have done as opposed to putting the plate underneath his fucking table but you know everyone's got to do what they have to do but i thought that was pretty lows um that of course isn't the main reason why. and again i just think the way they look is just a bit trash i think there was a video i saw recently actually of um a tale of us doing a live stream and just the way the equipment looks it just looks so sterile like you just your eyes get too distracted by because you're just staring at the person on the stage maybe that's the reason why because no one else in the in the actual room sharing the experience you just concentrate way too much on the actual equipment and i think this view of tale of us if i can find it here tale of us live stream what is it they played recently and it was a yeah this is the one um and it's just them standing in front of their studio, right? And it just, it looks a bit naff. Maybe it's just me, but it just looks a bit naff. Just look, look how many cables there are. Of course, it's their four because they're using, you know, fucking three, four turntables, it looks like. Um, but there's just so many cables. There's just so much stuff there. They've got, they're in their studio. It's just... <laughs> there's nothing really fun about it, you know? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just not a fan, man. I just don't think it necessarily brings out the best in them. But the interesting point of it is that somebody like a Tale of Us 
you know, one of the biggest crews out, or one of the biggest, you know, duos out there, we can only garner that amount of views, right? And so, nearly 200,000 has been uploaded on the 22nd of April, and you see people like a shot of the wheel on the media lens rack up millions. They're really, it's interesting to see the kind of the difference in numbers when it comes to streaming online, as opposed to maybe it has any correlation with fees. I'm not sure if it does, but. I'm sure they're in the same bracket when it comes to DJ fees, when it comes to Charlotte DeWitt and Amy Lee Lenz, it's probably in the same sort of bracket. But somehow within the numbers on the views online, they seem to somehow diverge. Charlotte DeWitt is on a whole other scale up here, and then these guys are way over there. doesn't make that much sense, does it, really? Which definitely goes to show that a lot of these bookers, when they're booking people based on the amount of followers and likes they get, how can you really quantify that? Because they're probably in the, they're probably in the thousands and the wit and those girls are probably on like millions around right, online maybe it's to do with the fact that they're women people will follow them more but i just find that really weird um that's the thing but yeah i'm just not for it i've kind of tapped out i might check a stream here and there and just look to just to view it and see where they are setting wise but i just don't necessarily think it's a fun experience and it sort of kind of strips away any kind of fun that you would have in a club night looking at somebody just playing somewhere that thinks a bit it's a little bit naff in my experience but you know what do i know anyway that's an hour of the show there thank you so much for tuning in to your snoozing a show episode number 306 i think as per usual if it's your first time listening smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment below if you're listening via the podcast app, of course if you find us a review and share with your friends um if you want information about myself Get my website below, iXanzinger.com, to find all my links to my show shows and stuff. Follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter on there. But until then, I'll see you guys until very, very soon. Take care. Bye.